Christians. All right. So the title of my sermon today is A Burning Stick Snatched from the Fire. Hmm. It's interesting. All right. Now, this is going to be a very spiritual kind of a, a passage here, and we'll try to unpack it and marry the natural and the spiritual together. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1. Now, and if you look at Zechariah's prophecies, these are all him telling you what he saw with the Lord. And then it says, then he showed me, God showed me, Joshua, the high priest. So there's a high, one high priest of Israel, and this high priest's name is Joshua. And he's standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has cho chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? We'll come back to that in a minute, but I love that description. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes, and he stood before the angel. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I'll give you a place among these standing here. Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come, I'm going to bring my servant the branch, the branch is coming. See the stone I've set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone, and I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty. And I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. And that day each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, there's a lot going on here in the spirit and the natural, and I'm going to just jump into point number one and talk through the job of the high priest. Now, we have to understand that uh, in Israel's day, in this, this Old Testament passage, that it was appropriate for the priest every day to bring an offering, bring an offering to the Lord. But there was one special day out of the whole year called the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement is when God had to judge your sin and the nation's sin. God had to judge your sin. And so God said to Moses and Aaron a long time ago, but it's being carried out by the new high priest, that once a year the high priest was to stand before the Lord without spot or blemish, wearing clean clothes, and his job was to bring a bull and bring a goat into the, the, the temple area. He was then to sacrifice the bull for his sin and the sin of his family. This is early chief repenter stuff, Chip. And so if he, he brought a bull and he says, first off, you've got to clean up your own self, then clean up your family, and then after that, you're going to offer the goat to me for the whole nation. And then one time a year, one person is allowed to enter the Holy of Holies, and that's the high priest. And when he comes in, he is to sprinkle the blood of the goat before the bema seat so that God had a legal right to push back judgment for one extra year. Just roll back judgment, delayed court. Got a chance. The high priest would come in. He would offer his sacrifice and the sacrifice of the family. Then he, when he went to the nation, he would offer the goat. He'd bring the blood in the Holy of Holies. And I can't, I've, I don't remember any place in Scripture. I could be wrong. We've got Bible scholars in the room. I can't remember any place in Scripture where God told them to make a rope to tie around the high priest in case they had to drag him out. But I'm pretty sure Israel came up with that and said, hey, he's a holy, holy God. We're not so holy. What if the high priest goes in and God kills him? What do we do then? Like, we should tie a rope around him. And that way, and we put bells on him. And then if we can't hear him, like, moving around in there, we might go drag him back out and say, okay, God, how, how do we start over from here? Now, you know you have a church when you have to drag, drag the high priest out of the holy of holy dead, right? I mean, that's some serious church service right there. And so what's fascinating about this passage is that it says that 
Zechariah is the prophet on the earth. So Zechariah is the prophet. He's looking at this scene of the courtroom of heaven and what's being played out numerous times around numerous circumstances. And we see the devil there, and the devil's accusing because he's the accuser of the brethren. He's looking for anything to disqualify you. He's looking for any reason to get God not to bless you, not to pour out his goodness on you. He's looking for, even when God said, have you considered my servant Job, who is blameless in my sight? The devil starts making up stuff. He only walks with you because you're so good to him. Look how good you are to him. If you weren't so good to him, he wouldn't serve you like that. And so the devil is constantly accusing us before the Lord. What's the greatest threat in that to you? It is not that God will listen to the devil. It's that you will listen to the devil. That's That's the biggest threat that we have is that when we hear the devil accusing us in front of the Lord, there's enough truth in there that we disqualify ourselves and pull away from the Lord instead of standing there and letting God rebuke the devil on our behalf and begin to move on our behalf. And I'll get to this in a minute, but when Evelyn prophesied about filthy rags, I'm like, that's in my sermon, girl. You don't even know. When there's a prophetic word that points out something in my sermon, that's like the Lord saying, sick them. That's like the Lord saying, go get them. I mean, you on the right track this morning, go get them. Don't hold anything back when I see that. When he confirms that through a worship song, and I'm like, oh, they're singing my sermon right now. I need to get in there. Let's go. And so what we see here is the high priest comes in and brings a sin offering. Then he brings the goat, to, and he, then God is allowed to roll the judgment back for another year. Until one day. When the Lord said, Satan, come before me. Today we will make the final judgment. No longer will we delay court. No longer will we hold off judgment. This is the moment you've been asking for. Here we are. Today is that day. Satan must have been so overwhelmed with joy that one, he intends to kill the Son of God on earth. And he's finally going to get judgment against all of God's people. But what he didn't know is when he killed Jesus Christ on the cross, that Jesus would take blood, not just a goat's blood, not a bull's, not a lamb's blood, but Jesus would now have his blood to ascend into the heavenlies and go before the throne of God and sprinkle his own blood before the Bema seat. And God says, now let's judge. And the devil's like, no, not today, not today. And God's like, no, today's the perfect day. Let's go ahead and judge. And I remember the time when I was, I did communion every, like, at least once a month we did communion. And as a minister, you're constantly trying to find a new way to, to express communion. And I remember one day I was like, Lord, I've done communion a hundred times. I, I don't know how else to explain communion to the people that's fresh and anew. And the Lord was so gracious, and he said this to me. He said, Jesus is both the priest and the sacrifice. You can't mess it up. There's nothing you can do. You're, you're not even involved. You can't mess it up. He's both the priest and his own sacrifice. He didn't leave anything to chance with us. He just said, Don't, you sit down and relax. I got the whole thing. I'm going to be the priest, but I'm also going to bring my sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. And then the scripture says in Hebrews that he is seated at the right hand of the Father as high priest forever. Forever. And it says, don't you know that we have a high priest we can go to that has suffered and understood and walked through what we've walked through? This high priest knows and understands the challenges of what we face as human beings. So we have this high priest, right hand of the Father. He's both priest and sacrifice. His blood that has not only rolled back our sin, but has forgiven our sin and removed us as far as the east is for the rest. Wow. And then he goes on to say that we are both kings and priests and we're seated in Christ Jesus. There's a priesthood duty that you and I serve. And every one of us is different. But you cannot be a priest under the high priest of Jesus and not serve in the priesthood. We're, we're part of the priesthood. And it says, it says that he has unlimitless mercy because of his great love. 
Limited mercy because of his great love. And if we are people of love, and he said, this is the one thing they'll know that you're my disciples, is that your love for one another. If, we're, if God is love and we're the people of love, our response needs to be mercy, even in correction, even in adjustments, That's right. in everything that we do, merciful. And, and I remember one time I saw someone in sin, and I said, Papa, they're in sin? He says, yeah, and they're not repenting for their sin. I said, oh, no, Papa, that's terrible. He said, so why don't you start repenting for them? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Nick, they're, they're not come to their senses yet. They don't know to repent. But if you see where they are as a priest, you can repent for them and buy them some grace to come to their senses until they can repent for themselves. And he said this to me, and I'll never forget it. He says, Nick, did you see their sin? I said, yes. He said, I'm not a gossip. I would never let you see something that has none of your business. If you see someone in a mess, it's for you to pray for them. That's if right. you see somebody in a mess, your job is to repent for them. If you see, so it's for you to stand before the courtroom of heaven and call out for God's mercy until they realize what they're in and they can do it for themselves. We have a role to play and it is not judgment. It is to stand before the Lord and say that none would perish and all would come to the goodness and to know the, the glory of the Lord. All right. Number two, the temple is a shadow of the throne room of heaven. And in Hebrews 8, it talks about, to, it, it talks about when God gave instructions about the temple, he said, build it exactly the way I'm telling you to build this. Because it is a shadow of what's happening in the, in the throne room of heaven. So God goes into great detail explaining the sacrifices and the protocol for the temple and all this stuff. And you get into Leviticus and you're like, if you're ever in a year-long Bible reading plan, you hate when you get to Leviticus and you're going to spend the next month. You hope you got enough personal encouragement to get through the month because Leviticus ain't going to give it to you. It's just, it's just it's hard plowing. It's hard reading, you're right? Why does God give us so much information about the Levitical uh, priesthood is because God's trying to train us of how to operate in the courtroom of heaven. We will never know what it's like to be the Levitical priesthood. We'll never know what it's like to show up and offer bulls and lambs on behalf of sin of other people. That's not what we need. Jesus already paid that price. We don't have to go back to that. But there's a modern day priesthood that still exists on this earth that needs to be able to move the courtroom of heaven to function on the earth. And, and so, it, and, I, and I'm going to unpack that more, but I want you to see that there's a temple on the earth. I truly believe there's a trading floor, a, a place where heaven and earth trade with each other, and it's called the altar. And the altar is where we lay something before the Lord, and then the Lord releases something back to us. So this morning in here, in worship, there's a trading floor where we can take our wickedness and give it to the Lord, and he can give us righteousness. We can give him our mourning, and he can give us his gladness. Right. This is where we do that on Sunday mornings. And I told the YWAMers, I said, you know what? You don't fit in the American church very well. And I'm not sure it's YWAM's fault. It could be the American church. Because why whammers are used to worshiping harp and bowl two and a half hours. And then the American church, man, we got dressed up. We already got lunch plans. We've already going to watch football today. We ain't expecting God to wreck us and we're going to be here for five hours today. I'm just telling. But I'm saying if you knew there was a trading floor this morning between you and the heavenlies, and when we come in here in the presence of the Lord and we're able to trade with the Lord and lay down ourselves to receive what he has, that's why understanding the temple and how it works on earth is so important so we can function in the heavenlies in a whole different way. I'll get more of that in a second. Number three, let's talk about our righteousness for a second. This is so good. Help me, Jesus. Mm. Evelyn said it earlier, our righteousness are like filthy rags. And yet, it is not our righteousness that saves us. And this is one of the big problems I see in the church today, including all of us in this room. You ready? 
If our good works could not save us, why do we keep evaluating ourselves from our good works? If our good works couldn't save us, why do we think our good works are going to please him? When Adam and Eve sinned, it did not keep God from walking in the cool of the morning to come see them again. And one of the things I love about this passage is this has got to be one of the most horrifying moments of Joshua the high priest's life. Because if you walk into the earthly temple, the earthly holy of holies, if you were to walk into the temple in the holy holies wearing filthy rags, you're immediately killed. But this ain't the earthly temple. This is the throne room of heaven. And oh my gosh, there's God, there's the angel, there's Satan accusing me of sin and unrighteousness, and you're covered in filthy garments. Can you imagine? The scariest place you could ever imagine as the high priest of God is standing, not in the Holy of Holies, but in the Holy of all Holies that have ever been, and now there's nothing you can say. You're guilty, you're bad, you're, you're broken, your righteousness is no good. And because of this passage, because of this sweet passage, the Lord said to me one time, he says, Nick, all of you in front of all of me, you don't hide anything from me. You don't keep anything from me. I already know. I already know. When I go before the Lord and he said, what's that behind your back? What do you mean? <laughs> and he said, I already know what's behind your back. Bring all of you before all of me. Quit trying to pretend you're okay. Quit trying to make me feel good about you. Just come and be all of you. There are at least a half dozen pastors, full-time pastors who have pastored in the ministry sitting in this room right now. And they know what it's like to have sinful thought or sinful action or get in a fight with your wife on the way to church to go preach. And they, they know what it's like to stand up there in your humanity and say, God, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough today to share the word of God to your people. They deserve so much better than me this morning, God. But you can't get out. I mean, God's called you to preach. He's called you to do this. And, and, and being a pastor is like working on the engine while the plane's flying. You, can't, you don't get to land it. you got to keep working on it, right? That's right? And that's where you find this incredible grace of God. Where you're sitting over there and you're just going, Papa, I'm doing all I know to do. This is a good word. This is your people. But I'm in the way. And somehow you just got to get me out of the way. And somehow we got to get past this. Because it's not the righteousness of the pastor. It's the righteousness of the God that sent the pastor. Right. And somehow we have to look past the worship leader and past the pastor to the God sitting on the throne. On. Saying, where does my help come from? It comes from the Lord. It doesn't come from this pastor. And it, yes. We got too many people in the church today that don't know how to get to God and are content to get to the representative God that is never good enough to represent God. That's right. Come on. And, and we got too many preachers that want to be God Junior that need to hang up that title because you ain't good enough to be Jesus Junior. And what they need is Jesus, not you. And if 2020 did something, it drove the body of Christ towards their pastors for pastoral care, but their struggles were way beyond pastoral care. Their mental health, their demonic, they're all kinds of stuff that the pastor's not trained to deal with. So the pastor, for the first time in American history, is having to say, we need help. We need a deliverance ministry. We need an inner healing ministry. We probably need a counseling ministry. We, we, we need to do a lot of stuff right now than just declaring the word of God over somebody, though that does work. I, um, I'm always amazed when I sin. I'm sort of like, I thought I was, I thought I was past some of that. I, I don't know about you. It's not, because I, it's not because I'm so prideful in who I am. It's just like I have a fit of carnality, and I'm like, where did that come from? How'd that happen? And Papa said to me one day, because I was, one time I had sinned, and I felt very ashamed. And, um, which makes me want to pull back, do a bunch of good works, make, trick myself into thinking that God loves me because now I'm behaving again, instead of just bringing all of me in front of all of him and said, here I stand again, right? 
And he told me this crazy revelation. He says, you know why you feel so ashamed? I said, why? He said, because when you brought your sin to me and you got saved, you brought everything you had already committed. But I, in that moment, looked forward to everything you ever would commit and still chose you. That's right. You only brought to me your past and said, will you exchange my past for your salvation? He said, but I had to look into the future at every sin you ever would commit and said, I'll take that deal. We can walk in freedom when we know we're already accepted by the Father. Chip was preaching at me at lunch this week and says, he loves me as much as he loves Jesus. I can't even get out of this. is crazy. This is crazy. And I'm like, I know. Isn't that crazy? I mean, so listen. Oh, my gosh. God did not love Jesus because it's perfection. Or he couldn't love us. So if he loves us like he loves Jesus, it's not because of perfection. That's right. It's because of what he sees in himself in us as his children and his ability to cover everything else. Amen. That's not in my notes. <laughs> chew, say la, chew on that a little bit. It's, it, 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 well, if he accepted us when we weren't perfect and accepted Jesus, then perfection is not the standard. What is the standard? It's obedience, surrender, love. He, he loves us so much. All right, number four. This is where I want to stay for a few minutes. All right. An interaction with heaven can cause a heavenly intervention. This is nowhere in your Bible, and there are pastors in the room that if you disagree with me, uh, I would welcome any feedback if you disagree later. <laughs> Unless it's true heresy and you got to call it out, I'll suck it up and I'll handle it today. I believe there are three kinds of churches on the earth today. The first church functions more in the natural than in the supernatural. And they care about issues like, let's just say, pro-life. And so they picket the pro-life place to try to get legislation changed. Something in their heart tells them that life is sacred but their only expression is in the natural to try to pick it so that they change legislation. Level two church are those who don't just pick it, but they prayer walk around an abortion clinic and call down God's goodness on what he's wanting to do here on earth praying for sanctity of life, but they, they move into the heavenly realm. But they're sitting on the earth calling up to heaven, asking heaven to come and do something. That's level two churches. Level three churches are those who can go up and enter into the heavenly realm and call down his will on earth as it is in heaven. It is, it is the ability, you understand this. I'm going to say something to you. I hope you understand. If you can leave the natural realm and sit in the courtroom of heaven in the heavenly realm, and you can but move his finger a twitch, you can change the situations on earth. All you have to do is get him to say a word, move his finger, nod his head a little bit, and things we've been fighting against for 50 years will suddenly come crumbling down. But they need operators in the heavenly realm to send top down. Now, when I talk about that, we tend to try to figure out well, which one am I? Which church? Well, are we in a one church? Are we in a two church? Are we in a three church? And I want to say to you, they all have value. God has left each of us a little incomplete so that we need each other. One body, many parts, different parts. And so... When I talk to people, uh, I, like for instance, when I think of a three church, I think of Bill Johnson, I think of IHOP. I think people that function in the supernatural and, and, and can actually like, do a church service. <laughs> and it's not just a harp and bowl, fig tree kind of prayer, and work, but, but also can care for the people. And so then like a level two church would be like um, Gateway Church, Robert Morris or T.D. Jakes, where, where they're, they're a two church that might function a little into the three. And then you have one church, and there's a bunch of those around us that we all know and care about. What I want to say to you is, 
in order to change something on the earth, we have to ground a word from the heavens. So the three sits in the heavenlies and gets God to rule, passes the assignment down to the two that does intercessory prayer and prayer marches and, and, and gives God his yes and his amen, but then passes it down to the one church so that not only do they ground it on the earth and change legislation, but they also realize their value to the two churches and to the three churches, all three matter. And our super spiritual threes don't have much respect for ones. Right. And our ones think the threes are crazy, and that's the, what the devil's given us. That's why we don't play well together. I'm telling you that God has created ones, twos, and threes to reach to the heavens for the purpose of the glorious decree of heaven can be grounded all the way to the earth. We need all three. Now, here's something I ain't ever heard anybody preach before in the Bible. Probably has, I just haven't heard it. And there are prophets in the room right now. And I want you to hear what I'm getting ready to say. If you will go to, let's start over in Zechariah 3, 1 real quick. This is Zechariah speaking. Zechariah is the prophet. And he says, then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Let me pause there before I get to my other revelation. I, I love this passage. I was at the fig tree one time and I was reading this passage. I probably read this passage more at the fig tree than outside the fig tree. And, um, and I was thinking about just a burning stick saved from the fire. I mean, have you all ever had, like, you have a good fire, you know, good outdoor fire? You sit there and you watch it burn. Well, if you're a stick, you can't protect yourself from the fire. And if you start burning, you're going to burn all the way through. You're done. And I love the, the, this visual. Is this not a burning stick I have plucked from the fire? And I said, Papa, sometimes I feel like I've barely survived. And thank God you came along and you picked me up. Oh, and then he said, yeah, but you're also a sweet incense. I love the smell you burn. I love, you are a burning stick. I did save and pluck you from the fire. But don't think that you're this martyr, victim, no value, no good. No, no, no. Now you're a fragrance that I smell of redemption, rescue, resurrection. I, I smell that in you. I, I, I bless my own soul. By watching the resurrection power come through you and offer up a fragrance to me. I love the fruit of resurrection. And I love that he calls us a stick. And then later he says, but I'm sending the branch. The branch is capital B. And he said, the branch is going to take away all the sin of the world in one day. So we're a reflection. Also, pay attention that the high priest's name is Joshua. A very common Jewish name, which means Yeshua which is a, a prophecy towards Jesus, the Messiah, whose name is Yeshua. So you're seeing a, a stick and a branch, and a Joshua and a Jesus. It's all tied together. And we have to function, and I used to preach this and say, listen, find the throne room of God. It's the center of what's going on. And if you're not careful, you can get caught over here looking at a bunch of crazy stuff going on in heaven and forget about the throne. Calibrate yourself to the throne room of God and then let your peripheral come into view because it don't make sense until you lock in on the throne room of God. That's right, man. All right, now watch this passage. Verse 3. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And, and the angel said, who said? The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I'll put fine garments on you. So his garments represented his iniquity and his sin. And so here we have the angel telling the attendants, take off his dirty, his dirty robe and his dirty turban. I'm washing away his sin. I'm putting a new robe on him. So they put a new robe on him. Verse 5. And he says, then I said, who said? The prophet on the earth. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him. Amen. 
No, no. All right. So everything that's happening in the heavenlies is already going on in the courtroom of heaven. The angel and the, the devil and God and the attendants and poor Joshua standing there in his dirty garments. And finally the angel says, take off his dirty garments. We're going to put clean garments on it. Wash away his iniquity. Make him clean. And Zechariah, the prophet on the earth who's watching this scene, can't help it. He jumps in and says, put a turban on his head too. And they do. And they do. I've seen lots of prophets that tap into level two from the earth, look for revelation from the heavenlies to then give on the earth. Nothing wrong with that. But what about a modern day prophet that can go sit in the heart of God, know the will of God, Declare from heaven God's will over my life, this church's life, this nation's life. What about you as a mom? So, so Bill Johnson has this great revelation. He talks about that when David got set in as king, it says immediately the Philistines came up to attack him. And David, David's saving grace as he inquires of the Lord over and over again. He makes mistakes, but that boy inquires of the Lord all the time. He said, Lord, should I go out and fight the Philistines? He said, yes, you should. David goes out and fights them and beats them. A few minutes later, in the next verse or two, it says, and then the Philistines came back to the same valley, Valley of Rephaim. And he says, God, should we go out and fight these? And God says, no, do not fight them. Go around them, get behind them. And when you hear the sound of the army of heaven marching in the trees, then you will know it is time for us to attack them and grab them. Now, this is what Bill Johnson says. He says, we as the people of God are both kings and sons. Kings and sons. Half the battles that God puts in front of you are for you to fight. So you understand your authority as a king of God with giftings, anointings, and powers and authorities... We're called to fight half of our battles. The other half, he says, you're not to fight. So that God can show you your position, not your authority, but your position as a son that you don't have to fight. Papa's going to fight it for us. And he said the church is losing half her battles because she's fighting all of them. Instead of waiting and let God fight half our battles. Think about the battles the church has fought for decades with no progress because they never heard the marching of the, of the army of God in the trees. They're still picketing and protesting. They're, they're still prayer walking. Instead of learning how, Papa, is this one I'm supposed to fight or is the armies of heaven coming to my rescue today? And God's like, how don't you about sit back and watch how I do this? And we so don't trust God and we get in a hurry, and we're just like, I'm going to throw a rock at him anyway, God. He's like, no, the rock's not going to work. It's not going to help anything. Don't throw a rock at him. Chill out. Chill out. Come sit with me in the heavenly realms and find out if you're supposed to fight this battle or not. And if you're not, sit back and watch the hand of God. And I tell you what, one thing that would mature the body of Christ as fast as anything is if we were to sit out the next five battles and watch him deliver without our help, our confidence in the Lord would go to a whole different level. But moms, who's got wayward kids, you can fuss if you want, manipulate if you want, but it may be that this battle's not yours to fight. And it may be that the right thing is to sit in the heavenlies every day with the Lord and repent on behalf of your loved one that doesn't have the grace to repent just yet. And sit them in the presence of an almighty God before the throne of heaven. And let God move for you. What if there's an ongoing court case against you in the heavens? That we've not resolved. 
that gives access for the enemy to make accusations against us over and over again because we've not resolved it. And, more importantly, when a judge rules on a case, somebody wins. What if your blessing's been held up in the courts of heaven because you haven't asked for a judgment? What if there's a blessing that's been left, a trial you overcame, a situation that was really hard for you, but you survived, but you've never been blessed from it? And I'm telling you right now that the courtroom of heaven revolves around the blood of Jesus and our forgiveness and then taking our position in the heart of Jesus, in the right hand of the Father. And I, I firmly, I know the goodness of God. And you're like, well, what if I missed a sin? What if I, what, what, what if I wasn't fully sincere when I apologized, when I repented? What, what, what? Do you think that God is an accountant that is the letter of the law? He takes us right where we are. And I think the Lord is looking for priests that will show up with their filthy rags. He says, Papa, my mind's not been right. My mouth's not been right. My actions haven't been right. And I'm asking you to forgive me. I want to work and I want to flow more in, in the supernatural in the reflection of your deity, that you created me to be fearlessly and wonderfully made. And yet sometimes, God, I act like every other human that's ever walked a planet on this earth. But God, my heart is broken, and I'm so sorry. And I, I honestly can say I've done the best I can do, but I'm sorry. I've come up short. Will you please forgive me? Will you have grace on me today like you have the last 20 years? Will you have grace once again on me? Forgive me for my sin. Forgive me for the shame that I've allowed to run my life the last couple of weeks, couple of months, whatever. And will you forgive me? And will you blot out my sin because of the blood of Jesus? And remove my sin as far as the east and the west and not remember it against me anymore? And, and my relationship with you not to be defined by my sin, but by your righteousness. And now that you have done that, because you're faithful and just to do what you said you're going to do, I ask you to judge me. Judge every area of my life. Judge me. If I'm innocent, release a, release a judgment and reward my way. If there's an area you still want to put your finger on, I welcome it. I can't get worse by asking God to judge me if my heart is sincere. He either releases a blessing or says, hey, there's some stuff over there you still need to take care of. Well, praise the Lord. Now we can do better business. We can be, do better trading with the Lord because we know what's there, right? And so I, I, I feel like there's a place in the body of Christ where we need to ascend up into the heavenlies and operate more from that direction. This church. I'm not talking about every church. I'm talking about this church. You can be a two church, but you need to function in the three so that you can pass it down to other partners around. And I think what God's waiting to do is let the king of glory become the king of this house. So we're not reaching up, begging God to pull something down, but we're sitting in the heart of God declaring something down because we know our positions as king and priest and sons of God. So while we are yet a burning stick plucked, from the fire. Oh, that burning incense has the opportunity to move the heart of God. And all we have to do is get him to go, just not a little bit. And all the kingdoms of this earth will crumble. And so Lord is looking for folks who can do both of those things. And I, like this word came to me on Friday. I've never preached it before. And I felt, okay, Lord, here we go. Uh, I trust Chip more than I trust anybody else to correct me, call me down if he feels like it's wrong. But I believe that's what, when I saw that Zechariah said, put a turban on his head, and they did. <laughs> Woo! What does that mean for us this morning? What can we do?